Chapter Fourteen of Agnes Gray by Anne Bronte. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Libby Gone. The Rector. The following day was as fine as the preceding one. Soon after breakfast, Miss Matilda, having galloped and blundered through a few unprofitable lessons, and vengeably thumped the piano for an hour, in a terrible humour with both me and it, because her mamma would not give her a holiday, had betaken herself to her favourite places of resort, the yards, the stables, and the dog-kennels, and Miss Murray was gone forth to enjoy a quiet ramble with a new fashionable novel for her companion, leaving me in the schoolroom hard at work upon a water-colour drawing which I had promised to do for her, and which she insisted upon my finishing that day. At my feet lay a little rough terrier. It was the property of Miss Matilda, but she hated the animal and intended to sell it, alleging that it was quite spoiled. It was really an excellent dog of its kind, but she affirmed it was fit for nothing, and had not even the sense to know its own mistress. The fact was she had purchased it when but a small puppy, insisting at first that no one should touch it but herself, but soon becoming tired of so helpless and troublesome a nursling, she had gladly yielded to my entreaties to be allowed to take charge of it, and I, by carefully nursing the little creature from infancy to adolescence, of course had obtained its affections, a reward I should have greatly valued and looked upon as far outweighing all the trouble I had had with it, had not poor Snap's grateful feelings exposed him to many a harsh word, and many a spiteful kick and pinch from his owner, and were he not now in danger of being put away in consequence, or transferred to some rough, stony-hearted master. But how could I help it? I could not make the dog hate me by cruel treatment, and she would not propitiate him by kindness. However, while I thus sat working away with my pencil, Mrs. Murray came, half sailing, half bustling into the room. "'Miss Gray,' she began, "'dear, how can you sit at your drawing such a day as this?' She thought I was doing it for my own pleasure. "'I wonder you don't put on your bonnets and go out with the young ladies.' "'I think, ma'am, Miss Murray is reading, and Miss Matilda is amusing herself with her dogs.' if you would try to amuse miss matilda yourself a little more i think she would not be driven to seek amusement in the companionship of dogs and horses and grooms so much as she is and if you would be a little more cheerful and conversable with miss murray she would not so often go wandering in the fields with a book in her hand however i don't want to vex you added she seeing suppose that my cheeks burned and my hand trembled with some unamiable emotion do pray try not to be so touchy there's no speaking to you else and tell me if you know where rosalie is gone and why she likes to be so much alone she says she likes to be alone when she has a new book to read but why can't she read it in the park or the garden why should she go into the field and lanes and how is it that mr hatfield so often finds her out she told me last week he'd walked his horse by her side all up moss lane and now I'm sure it was he I saw from my dressing-room window, walking so briskly past the park gates, and on towards the field where she so frequently goes. I wish you would go and see if she is there, and gently remind her that it is not proper for a young lady of her rank and prospects to be wandering about by herself in that manner, exposed to the attentions of any one that presumes to address her, like some poor neglected girl that has no park to walk in, and no friends to take care of her and tell her that her papa would be extremely angry if he knew of her treating mr hatfield in the familiar manner that i fear she does and oh if you if any governess had but half a mother's watchfulness half a mother's anxious care i should be saved this trouble and you would see at once the necessity of keeping your eye on her and making your company agreeable to well go go there's no time to be lost cried she seeing that i had put away my drawing materials and was waiting in the doorway for the conclusion of her address according to her prognostications i found miss murray in her favourite field just without the park and unfortunately not alone 
for the tall, stately figure of Mr. Hatfield was slowly sauntering by her side. Here was a poser for me. It was my duty to interrupt the tete-a-tete, but how was it to be done? Mr. Hatfield could not be driven away by so insignificant a person as I, and to go and place myself on the other side of Miss Murray, and intrude my unwelcome presence upon her without noticing her companion, was a piece of rudeness I could not be guilty of. Neither had I the courage to cry aloud from the top of the field that she was wanted elsewhere. So I took the intermediate course of walking slowly but steadily towards them, resolving if my approach failed to scare away the bow, to pass by and tell Miss Murray her mamma wanted her. She certainly looked very charming as she strolled, lingering along under the budding horse-chestnut trees that stretched their long arms over the park palings, with her closed book in one hand, and in the other a graceful sprig of myrtle, which served her as a pretty plaything, her bright ringlets escaping profusely from her little bonnet, and gently stirred by the breeze, her fair cheek flushed with gratified vanity, her smiling blue eyes, now slyly glancing toward her admirer, now glancing downward at her myrtle sprig. But Snap, running before me, interrupted her in the midst of some half-pert, half-playful repartee, by catching hold of her dress and vehemently tugging thereat, till Mr. Hatfield with his cane administered a resounding thwack upon the animal's skull, and sent it yelping back to me with a clamorous outcry that afforded the reverend gentleman great amusement. But seeing me so near, he thought, I suppose, he might as well be taking his departure. And as I stooped to caress the dog, with ostentatious pity to show my disapproval of his severity, I heard him say, when shall i see you again miss murray at church i suppose at church i suppose replied she unless your business chances to bring you here again at the precise moment when i happen to be walking by i could always manage to have business here if i knew precisely when and where to find you but if i would i could not inform you for i am so immethodical i never can tell to-day what i shall do to-morrow then give me that meantime to comfort me he said half jestingly and half in earnest extending his hand for the sprig of myrtle no indeed i shan't do pray do i shall be the most miserable of men if you don't you cannot be so cruel as to deny me a favour so easily granted and yet so highly prized pleaded he as ardently as if his life depended on it by this time I stood within a very few yards of them, impatiently waiting his departure. "'There, then, take it, and go,' said Rosalie. He joyfully received the gift, murmured something that made her blush and toss her head, but with a little laugh that showed her displeasure was entirely affected, and then, with a courteous salutation, withdrew. "'Did you ever see such a man, Miss Gray?' said she, turning to me. "'I'm so glad you came. I thought I never should get rid of him. And I was so terribly afraid of papa seeing him. Has he been with you long? No, not long. But he's so extremely impertinent, and he's always hanging about, pretending his business or his clerical duties require his attendance in these parts, and really watching for poor me, and pouncing upon me wherever he sees me. "'Well, your mamma thinks you ought not to go beyond the park or garden "'without some discreet, matronly person like me to accompany you "'and keep off all intruders.' "'She descried Mr. Hatfield hurrying past the park gates "'and forthwith dispatched me with instructions to seek you up "'and to take care of you, and likewise to warn, "'Oh, mamma's so tiresome! "'As if I couldn't take care of myself!' She bothered me before about Mr. Hatfield, and I told her she might trust me. I never should forget my rank and station for the most delightful man that ever breathed. I wish he would go down on his knees to-morrow and implore me to be his wife, that I might just show her how mistaken she is in supposing that I could ever— oh, provokes me so—to think that I could be such a fool as to fall in love— it is quite beneath the dignity of a woman to do such a thing. Love, 
i detest the word as applied to one of our sex i think it's a perfect insult a preference i might acknowledge but never for one like poor mr hatfield who has not seven hundred a year to bless himself with i like to talk to him because he is so clever and amusing i wish sir thomas ashby were half as nice besides i must have somebody to flirt with and no one else has the sense to come here and when we go out mamma won't let me flirt with anybody but sir thomas if he's there and if he's not there i'm bound hand and foot for fear somebody should go and make up some exaggerated story and put it into his head that i'm engaged or likely to be engaged to somebody else or what is more probable for fear his nasty mother should see or hear of my ongoings and conclude that i'm not a fit wife for her excellent son as if the said son were not the greatest scamp in christendom and as if any woman of common decency were not a world too good for him is that really so miss murray and does your mamma know it and yet you wish to marry him to be sure she does she knows more against him than i do i believe she keeps it from me lest i should be discouraged not knowing how little i care about such things but it's no great matter really he will be all right when he's married as mamma says and reformed rakes make the best husbands everybody knows i only wish he were not so ugly that's all i think about but then there's no choice here in the country and papa will not let us go to london but i should think mr hatfield would be far better and so he would if he were lord of ashby park there's not a doubt of it but the fact is i must have ashby park whoever shares it with me but mr hatfield thinks you like him all this time you don't consider how bitterly he will be disappointed when he finds himself mistaken no indeed it will be a proper punishment for his presumption for ever daring to think i could like him i should enjoy nothing so much as lifting the veil from his eyes the sooner you do it the better then no i tell you i like to amuse myself with him besides he doesn't really think i like him i take good care of that you don't know how cleverly i manage he may presume to think he can induce me to like him for which i shall punish him as he deserves well mind you don't give him too much reason for such presumption that's all replied i but all my exhortations were in vain they only ever made her somewhat more solicitous to disguise her wishes and her thoughts from me she talked no more to me about the rector but i could see that her mind if not her heart was fixed upon him still and that she was intent upon obtaining another interview for though in compliance with her mother's request i was now constituted the companion of her rambles for a time she still persisted in wandering in the fields and lanes that lay in the nearest proximity to the road and whether she talked to me or read the book she carried in her hand she kept continually pausing to look round her or gaze up the road to see if any one was coming and if any horseman trotted by i could tell by her unqualified abuse of the poor equestrian whoever he might be that she hated him because he was not mr hatfield surely thought i she is not so indifferent to him as she believes herself to be or would have others to believe her and her mother's anxiety is not so wholly causeless as she affirms three days passed away and he did not make his appearance on the afternoon of the fourth as we were walking beside the park palings in the memorable field each furnished with a book for i always took care to provide myself with something to be doing when she did not require me to talk she suddenly interrupted my studies by exclaiming oh miss gray do be so kind as to go and see mark wood and take his wife half a crown from me i should have given or sent it a week ago but quite forgot there said she throwing me her purse and speaking very fast never mind getting it out now but take the purse and give them what you like i would go with you but i want to finish this volume i'll come and meet you when i've done it be quick will you and oh wait hadn't you better read to him a bit run to the house and get some sort of a good book anything will do i did as i was desired 
but suspecting something from her hurried manner and the suddenness of the request i just glanced back before i quitted the field and there was mr hatfield about to enter at the gate below by sending me to the house for a book she had just prevented my meeting him on the road never mind thought i there'll be no great harm done poor mark will be glad of the half-crown and perhaps of the good book too and if the rector does steal miss rosalie's heart it will only humble her pride a little and if they do get married at last it will only save her from a worse fate and she will be quite a good enough partner for him and he for her mark wood was the consumptive labourer whom i mentioned before he was now rapidly wearing away miss murray by her liberality obtained literally the blessing of him that was ready to perish for though the half-crown could be of very little service to him he was glad of it for the sake of his wife and children so soon to be widowed and fatherless after i had sat a few minutes and read a little for the comfort and edification of himself and his afflicted wife i left them but i had not proceeded fifty yards before i encountered mr weston apparently on his way to the same abode he greeted me in his usual quiet unaffected way stopped to inquire about the condition of the sick man and his family and with a sort of unconscious brotherly disregard to ceremony took from my hand the book out of which i had been reading turned over its pages made a few brief but very sensible remarks and restored it then told me about some poor sufferer he had just now been visiting talked a little about nancy brown made a few observations upon my little rough friend the terrier that was frisking at his feet and finally upon the beauty of the weather and departed i have omitted to give a detail of his words from a notion that they would not interest the reader as they did me and not because i have forgotten them no i remember them well for i thought them over and over again in the course of that day and many succeeding ones i do not know how often and recalled every intonation in his deep clear voice every flash of his quick brown eye and every gleam of his pleasant but too transient smile such a confession will look very absurd i fear but no matter i have written it and they that read it will not know the writer while i was walking along happy within and pleased with all around miss murray came hastening to meet me her buoyant step flushed cheek and radiant smiles showing that she too was happy in her own way running up to greet me she put her arm through mine and without waiting to recover breath began now miss gray think yourself highly honoured for i am come to tell you my news before i breathe a word of it to any one else well what is it oh such news in the first place you must know that mr hatfield came upon me just after you were gone i was in such a way for fear papa or mamma should see him but you know i couldn't call you back again and so oh dear i can't tell you all about it now for there's matilda i see in the park and i must go and open my budget to her but however hatfield was most uncommonly audacious unspeakably complimentary and unprecedentedly tender I tried to be so at least he didn't succeed very well in that because it's not his vein i'll tell you all he said another time but what did you say i'm more interested in that i'll tell you that too at some future period i happened to be in a very good humour just then but though i was complacent and gracious enough i took care not to compromise myself in any possible way but however the conceited wretch chose to interpret my amiability of temper his own way and at length presumed upon my indulgence so far what do you think he actually made me an offer and you i proudly drew myself up and with the greatest coolness expressed my astonishment at such an occurrence and hoped he had seen nothing in my conduct to justify his expectations you should have seen how his countenance fell he went perfectly white in the face i assured him that i esteemed him and all that but could not possibly accede to his proposals and if i did papa and mamma could never be brought to give their consent 
but if they could said he would yours be wanting certainly mr hatfield i replied with a cool decision which quelled all hope at once oh if you had seen how dreadfully mortified he was how crushed to earth by his disappointment really i almost pitied him myself one more desperate attempt however he made after a silence of considerable duration during which he struggled to be calm and i to be grave for i felt a strong propensity to laugh which would have ruined all he said with a ghost of a smile but tell me plainly miss murray if i had the wealth of sir hugh melton or the prospects of his eldest son would you still refuse me answer me truly upon your honour certainly said i that would make no difference whatever it was a great lie but he looked so confident in his own attraction still that i determined not to leave him one stone upon another he looked me full in the face but i kept my countenance so well that he could not imagine i was saying anything more than the actual truth then it's all over i suppose he said looking as if he could have died upon the spot with vexation at the intensity of his despair but he was angry as well as disappointed there was he suffering so unspeakably and there was i the pitiless cause of it all so utterly impenetrable to all the artillery of his looks and words so calmly cold and proud he could not but feel some resentment but with singular bitterness he began i certainly did not expect this miss murray i might say something about your past conduct and the hopes you have led me to foster but i forbear on condition no condition mr hatfield said i now truly indignant at his insolence then let me beg it a favour he replied lowering his voice at once and taking a humbler tone let me entreat that you will not mention this affair to any one whatever if you will keep silence about it there need be no unpleasantness on either side nothing i mean beyond what is quite unavoidable for my own feelings i will endeavour to keep them to myself if i cannot annihilate them i will try to forgive if i cannot forget the cause of my sufferings i will not suppose miss murray that you know how deeply you have injured me i would not have you aware of it but if in addition to the injury you have already done me pardon me but whether innocently or not you have done it and if you add to it by giving publicity to this unfortunate affair or naming it at all you will find that i too can speak and though you have scorned my love you will hardly scorn my he stopped but he bit his bloodless lip and looked so terribly fierce that i was quite frightened however my pride upheld me still and i answered disdainfully i do not know what motive you suppose i could have for naming it to any one mr hatfield but if i were disposed to do so you would not deter me by threats and it is scarcely the part of a gentleman to attempt it pardon me miss murray said he i have loved you so intensely i do still adore you so deeply that i would not willingly offend you but though i never have loved and never can love any woman as i have loved you it is still equally certain that i was never so ill-treated by any on the contrary i have always found your sex the kindest and most tender and obliging of all god's creation till now oh, think of the conceited fellow saying that and the novelty and harshness of the lesson you have taught me to-day and the bitterness of being disappointed in the only quarter on which the happiness of my life depended must excuse any appearance of asperity if my presence is disagreeable to you miss murray he said for i was looking about me to show how little i cared for him so he thought i was tired of him i suppose if my presence is disagreeable to you miss murray you have only to promise me the favour i named and i will relieve you at once there are many ladies even some in this parish who would be delighted to accept what you have so scornfully trampled under your feet they would be naturally inclined to hate one whose surpassing loveliness has so completely estranged my heart from them and blinded me to their attractions and a single hint of the truth from me to one of these would be sufficient to raise such a talk against you as would seriously injure your prospects and diminish your chance of success with any other gentleman you or your mamma might design to entangle what do you mean sir 
said I, ready to stamp with passion. I mean that this affair, from beginning to end, appears to me like a case of errant flirtation, to say the least of it. Such a case as you would find it rather inconvenient to have blazoned through the world, especially with the additions and exaggerations of your female rivals, who would be too glad to publish the matter, if I only gave them a handle to it. But I promise you, in the faith of a gentleman, that no word or syllable that could tend to your prejudice shall ever escape my lips, provided you will— Well, well, I won't mention it, I said. You may rely upon my silence, if that can afford you any consolation. You promise it? Yes, I answered, for I wanted to get rid of him now. Farewell, then, said he, in a most doleful, heartsick tone, and with a look where pride vainly struggled against despair, he turned and went away again, longing, no doubt, to get home, that he might shut himself up in his study and cry, if he doesn't burst into tears before he gets there. But you have broken your promise already, said I, truly horrified at her perfidy. Oh, it's only to you. I know you won't repeat it. Certainly I shall not. But you say you were going to tell your sister, and she will tell your brothers when they come home, and Brown immediately, if you do not tell her yourself. And Brown will blazon it, or be the means of blazoning it throughout the country. No, indeed she won't. We shall not tell her at all, unless it be under promise of the strictest secrecy. But how can you expect her to keep her promises better than her more enlightened mistress? Well, well, she shan't hear it then, said Miss Murray somewhat snappishly. But you will tell your mamma, of course, pursued I, and she will tell your papa. Of course I shall tell mamma. That is the very thing that pleases me so much. I shall now be able to convince her how mistaken she was in her fears about me. Oh, that's it, is it? I was wondering what it was that delighted you so much. Yes, and another thing is, that I have humbled Mr. Hatfield so charmingly, and another, why you must allow me some share of female vanity, I don't pretend to be without the most essential attribute of our sex, and if you had seen poor Hatfield's intense eagerness in making his ardent declaration and his flattering proposal, and his agony of mind, that no effort of pride could conceal on being refused, you would have allowed I had some cause to be gratified. The greater his agony, I should think, the less your cause for gratification. Oh, nonsense! cried the young lady, shaking herself with vexation. You either can't understand me or you won't. If I had not confidence in your magnanimity, I should think you envied me. But you will perhaps comprehend this cause of pleasure, which is as great as any, namely, that I am delighted with myself for my prudence, my self-command, my heartlessness, if you please. I was not a bit taken by surprise, not a bit confused, or awkward or foolish. I just acted and spoke as I ought to have done, and I was completely my own mistress throughout. And here was a man, decidedly good-looking. Jane and Susan Green call him bewitchingly handsome. I suppose they're two of the ladies he pretends would be so glad to have him. But, however, he was certainly a very clever, witty, agreeable companion. Not what you call clever, but just enough to make him entertaining. And a man one needn't be ashamed of anywhere, and would not soon grow tired of. And to confess the truth, I rather liked him better even of late than Harry Melton, and he evidently idolized me. And yet, though he came upon me all alone and unprepared, I had the wisdom and the pride and the strength to refuse him, and so scornfully and coolly as I did, I have good reason to be proud of that. And are you equally proud of having told him that his having the wealth of Sir Hugh Melton would make no difference to you, and that was not the case? and of having promised to tell no one of his misadventure, apparently without the slightest intention of keeping your promise. Of course! What else could I do? You would not have had me. But I see, Miss Gray, you're not in a good temper. Here's Matilda. I'll see what she and Mamma have to say about it. She left me, offended at my want of sympathy, 
and thinking no doubt that i envied her i did not at least i firmly believed that i did not i was sorry for her i was amazed disgusted at her heartless vanity i wondered why so much beauty should be given to those who made so bad a use of it and denied to some who would make it a benefit to both themselves and others but god knows best i concluded there are i suppose some men as vain as selfish and as heartless as she is and perhaps such women may be useful to punish them End of chapter 14